It is 5 p.m. Pacific on Friday night. You know what that means. It is time for Eric Wait Live. So pour yourself a dram, whether you're watching live or on the replay, and uh, we'll do a little bit of drinking, talk a little bit more about peated whiskeys. All righty. So uh, in this live stream, going to do... Um, Ardbeg, I'm looking at the camera and it's reversed, so I get a little confusing. So doing Ardbeg versus the Lechek 10. So 10 versus 10 year old, but while I've been getting things ready, I've actually poured myself a little bit of the Johnny Walker Black. It goes for about 28 bucks. Um, it has no smoke and peat in it. Similar to the other Johnny Walker Black, except for this does not have an age statement, bottled at 40%, uh, yeah, 40% alcohol by volume. There's been a few times where I've actually picked up a Johnny Walker that was 43%. I don't know if it was a strange anomaly, but anyhow, um, it's a nice, I would say, warm up to an evening of peated whiskeys. Several different things going on with that before I jump into these and a few other things. Um, Blended Scotch whiskeys have a completely different mouthfeel than malts. Uh, it's made up of uh, uh, grain whiskey as well. And grain whiskey, particularly if you're using maize or corn as the as the base of the uh, grain whiskey, it gives a little bit more of a softer feel, rounded mouthfeel, almost sort of like an Irish whiskey, a little creamier, a little easier, not as that much of that intense maltiness there. Uh, but it's got the nice smoke in there, and for under thirty bucks, I think I think it's a pretty good whiskey. But in terms of learning, in terms of comparing uh, blended whiskeys with um, malt uh, scotch, you know, blended scotch versus malt scotch, it really makes the malt character of single malt sort of pop, you know, because malt is much more of a, a subtle note, you know, uh, in comparison to everything else that be going on with the casks or the peat. Whatever is going on in a in a, in a single malt, and so what makes it distinctively a single malt is is the malt, and there's a slight malty character, which some people don't like. I do. It can come across some as a, like a like a breakfast cereal note, that sort of slightly uh, grainy texture to it in the background, and I really really uh, like it. So I'm actually warming up with a, a little bit of the Johnny Walker Black, but I'll pour myself. Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. A little bit of the Lechik, a little bit of the Ardbeg 10-year-old. Got a whole bunch tuning in here tonight. Hopefully, the live streams will continue to grow an audience as I make this a regular thing. And so that everybody knows, hey, it's 5 o'clock Pacific. I don't know what time, whatever it is, where you're at. Time for Eric Wade to go live. And I'm going to make this, keep this going fun as well as a little bit informative. So if you are tuning in for the first time for one of my Friday nights, I started doing these just before Christmas or redoing these or started doing them again just before Christmas. Um, been doing a little quiz, using some slides, but not go too heavily um, academic. But I've been building up information about peated whiskeys. So if you haven't watched the previous uh, live streams and, and we've been doing these little quiz questions, using it more of a conversation starter than actually something super heavily uh, academic and also... Um, uh, put a little, you know, a few joke answers in there as well. All right, so I got a whole bunch in, in the house. I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. Ben Demon Hunter, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, Michael C. 2019, thanks for tuning in. Mike Bennett, thanks for tuning in. Doug Chrisup. And the first one actually in the house was Jacob H. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And, and Whiskey Street Out over there in Ireland. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in, sir. And Daryl Macias, thank you much for uh, tuning in. And Adrian, just tuned in. Marroquin, hope or Harp Marroquin. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. Alrighty, so let me know what you guys are uh, drinking, and uh, we'll continue on here. So I'm gonna pour myself a little bit of the Ardbeg Ten as well. So I don't have any quiz questions per se for this week. How many quiz questions can you make about Isla, right? Excuse me, about uh, Pete, right? So I, I did ten of them in the previous videos. I do, however, want to sort of share a summary video of the peating process uh, of peat. Something I put together, a few photos, and, I, and, and uh, a narration 
uh, in there with a little bit of uh, music. Also, uh, um, a viewer, a new viewer, uh, sent me a question. Something I think I'm going to start doing is Daniel and Rex at the end of their regular videos. You know, they had someone asked a question or made a comment, and they responded at the end of every one of their videos. I don't want to do that in my regular videos, but I thought, you know, live streams would be a great time to answer questions. So if someone asks a question either via email or maybe in a comment section down below in, in the chat or Facebook, anywhere I can find, I think, a really, really good answers that would be good to use uh, in here, I will share them here. I'm not, I'm not going to give out your you know, obviously your email information or anything like that, just it, because if I answer a question, whatever question you have, a lot of other people have the exact same question, right? So rather than answer just one person at a time, you know, I can answer a whole bunch of people all at once um, uh, by answering that one question. I think it's a really, really good question that'd be really good for a whole bunch of other people, but we're going to get into that later on in the shoe. Chris McManus, if I didn't say hello already, um, I'll just do so now. All right. Thank you for tuning in. All right. So let me just kick off this video real quick. It's only about a minute. When the organic vegetal matter becomes partially decayed in a bog. Second, the peat is then cut. Third, the peat is then stacked. And fourth, the peat is left to dry for a few months. The peat is then transported to the distillery or a malting house, where the peat is then burned for up to 18 hours. And then finally, the fumes of the smoldering peat adheres to the barley. Eight, the barley is then air dried for 42 hours below 60 degrees Celsius. All right, so when you see the, the picture there with the looks like a roaring fire, in terms of the distilleries that I visited where they were, uh, you know, burning peat, it's more of a smoldering than a roaring fire. I think the photos tend to get taken when the fire is more roaring, when they're first starting it up, because it looks more dramatic than just some dirt that's got some smoke coming out of it, right? So I don't think the whole process of, of burning the peat is going to look like that red, you know, burning fire. I think that's just when they first started up. And of course, as we mentioned in previous videos, they can sort of calibrate the amount of smoke using a material called Coke, not like Coke or Coca-Cola you drink, um, which is basically uh, made from sort of a charcoal Anyway, I covered that in another video. I'm not going to do it again here. Whiskey Straight Out says, just had a Berry Brothers and Red Orkney Island 1556.8. Whoa, percent alcohol by volume. So good. Now on a Secret Spirits Royal Blocka. Oh, Royal Blocka. Brockla. Brockla. Yeah, Royal Blocka. Uh, age 12-year-old at 57.5. Wow, that's some big-ass whiskeys. So in terms of training the palate and learning peat, I think um, trying peated peat from, from a blend and comparing that with uh, Sioux Malt is a worthy study in itself. So that if you're blinded and you go, because your brain wants to jump ahead um, to the end, oh, I'm smelling this peat, therefore it might be this, da, 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 before you fully give it a full an an analysis. When you're under stress, when you take an exam, um, there is, there's a two parts of your brain. There's a slow processing and a fast processing. You use your fast processing when you're driving down the freeway, down the highway, and someone cuts you off, you don't have time to analyze the situation. You have to re reflexively respond, right? So it's like, oh, crud. And the, you make very, very, very quick calculations, and you respond, brake, backing off, letting off the gas, changing lanes. And when you're under stress, such as an exam, psychologically, you tend to jump to that quick thinking process, like you would if you're trying to avoid getting into an accident. And the result is, before you really have all the data in smelling and tasting, you tend to jump as to what you think it is. And once you do that, once you get that thought in your head, it's hard to get it out. It's hard to get to go, oh, smoke, oh, smoke, Pete, uh, uh, must be Isla. You know, you, I've already jumped the gun all the way to the end 
before I've done all the full analysis. So psychologically, and I covered this, I did a series on blind tasting. So in blind tasting, you don't want, you want to withhold judgment until you've been able to go through all the data. And just because that's a little smoke, as we're learning here, you're going Isla versus the Highland Pedro Whiskey doesn't necessarily mean that it is from Isla, right? All right. And what we're really learning is, wow, there are a lot of peated whiskeys in Highlands, a lot of them. And just, I would say just about every distillery, even if they don't distribute it, almost every distributor, almost every distillery, it seems, makes a peated whiskey, but a lot of them are not distributed. I have one from Glenn Morey, uh, PX Peated Cask, which I'm gonna, I'll do a re-review on it during the series. It's not distributed. So you can go to the distillery and you go, oh, wow, they got a peated, and they got a peated, and they got a peated, and they got a peated, but the only, sometimes the only place you can get them, either specialty shop, someone went up there and bought it, and then secondhand, uh, or you get it from straight from the distillery. Nice. So uh, Michael Hassler asked, that's why I was asking where Isle of Mole was. I should keep a I should keep a map ready. So anybody asks a geographical question, I could click it and bring it up. Uh, a note for future, I will have one available anytime we ask a question. But basically, um, let's say this is Scotland. This is Scotland. Okay, so this is this is the low this is the lowlands. This is the top part of the highlands. Up here would be Orkney. Um, over, I should I get this right? Over here. Uh, over here would be Isla. Going down the coast here would be the Kintyre Peninsula with uh, Campbelltown. So you'd have Glasgow. You <laughs> you have Edinburgh. Up here you would have Aberdeen. So those are the three major cities: Aberdeen. Then you have these uh, coastal uh, the, uh, the Hebrides, the Hebrides Islands o over here. Uh, and so north of Isla and Jura is the Isle of Mull, and then you have Sky and others over there. So I'm, it's just, I memorize geography on my hand. Uh, so over here would over here would be Speyside, would be Speyside, and there's upper part of the Highlands. The most northern distillery up here is Wolfburn, and then you get a little you get, get a little boat, you go up here to Orkney. All right, so there you go. I have a big map of Scotland uh, with all the distilleries on it uh, on my wall in my office. So there you go. Oh, and then I've got Isle of Aaron. Uh, Isle of Aaron. So Isle of Aaron is between the Kintyre Peninsula and then the mainland. There's a little Isle of Ireland in there as well. Uh, oh, Winoni, thank you much for tuning in. Uh, AL, I think it's Al. Thank you much for uh, tuning in. Hmm. So geography is really, really important for memorizing um, uh, wines and whiskeys. Now, not because I, I had I had this discussion in another group on Facebook. It's not just all about terroir. Why bother to memorize a map if Tobar is not that big of an issue with whiskey? Because memorization is two facts that are tied together, right? Two facts. It could be a photo of something, and you tie certain facts related to that photo, right? It could be a mnemonic device. So a lot of times you're learning languages, and you're learning foreign words, but they remind you of another word, or learning Latin, learning Greek. Uh, a lot of terminology from uh, the uh, from medicine, pharmaceuticals, uh, and, and and the sciences comes from, is based on Greek or Latin words. So you can memorize Greek or Latin. It took two years of Greek, two years of Latin, because associated with with scientific stuff. Or you just make up little mnemonic devices. So a map is a great mnemonic device for memorizing uh, distilleries, production, and so on and so forth. Not to mention. I've been over there a couple of times, traveling around, and you get sort of oriented as to what is uh, where on, on Scotland. All righty. Um, oh, uh, Al says he's enjoying an Aaron Sherry cast. Isle of Aaron was absolutely fantastic. Love visiting uh, Aaron as well as um, on the on the southern end, um, Lag, Lag Distillery, although uh, we just tasted new make. All right. So, uh, da -da 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 -da. So I don't have any quiz questions this week. I do want to get into these two whiskeys. Um, but I'll, let's bring up a slide with some notes on it, and we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison. And I think it's really, really a good match. Where in the heck is it? 
Oh, there we go. Hold on. There we go. All righty. So I think this is probably probably one of the most fair and even um, head to heads. It, it's doing head to heads can be a little bit challenging because you want to get as close as possible. You know, doing a cast strength from one distillery and a non cast strength from another distillery, it's an uneven match. Or you know, a non peated versus a peated, or not to mention you know, say a bourbon versus a scotch. Unless you're just trying to learn to memorize and recognize a scotch versus a bourbon. But if you're actually doing a comparison and going head to head and see which one you prefer or which one you think is better or whatever like that, they really need to be, I think, more evenly matched. I mean, you don't want to put, you don't want to put, you know, Mike Tyson in in the ring with uh, Pee Wee Herman, right? So the Lechik Ten, or some people in Scotland say Lechig, depending on where you live. Um, it's peated at 37 ppm, whereas the Ardbeg 10 is peated. That some notes say 55. They say anywhere between 55 and 65 ppm. So the first question you want to ask is, you know, in in the is that peat really going to make that big of a difference between 37 and say 55? And as we learned in previous live streams, previous notes, is that p, 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 uh, ppm is measured before the uh, barley is uh, ground into grist and gone through the mashing and the fermentation and distillation and all that. So a lot of the uh, PPMs is lost during the process, not to mention aging. So a lot of the peat character can be lost or reduced in aging as well. So it's really relative to everything else and how it's handled, particularly the cuts. A lot of the phenolics of the uh, parts per million uh, from peat is lost in the cuts. So how narrow are you doing your cuts at the uh, uh, spirit bank coming out of the stills? That's a huge, huge factor. In fact, I would say probably the largest portion of the loss of the PPM is going to be determined at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So the both unchill filtered, uh, what are they are uh, on uh, non-colored or not? is up for a debate, particularly the Electric 10. Now, if you saw this week's um, review of my of the Electric 10, or the Chag 10, uh, some of the bottles were a lighter color, whereas this one is a darker color. The image I'm using here is a different one that I used in my video. And that's, I'm searching around and I don't know, I, it's hard to tell. If you saw my video, I commented that it almost seemed as if it could have spent a day or two in a, in a sherry cask, but it's not listed. But according to the records, they're both ex bourbon casts. The ABVs are super close. And even that, you know, 46.3 versus 46 ABV, you know, how perfectly they're measured. I mean, the 46 uh, for the Ardbeck could be 46.1. You know, it, you're, they're cl you're close enough. And then price wise, they're evenly matched as well. Of course, this is relative to uh, where you're living, right? But this is my neighborhood, uh, Ardbeck 10. 50 to 55 dollars so KL in the bay area in redwood city has it for 50 dollars the total wine and more near where i live has it for 55 and electric 10 in my neighborhood uh, total wine and more is 57 dollars but uh someone commented on my video uh, which sounds absolutely insane i think it was down in florida that ardbeg 10 was selling for a hundred dollars and that to me sounds uh, insane so really too evenly matched whiskeys in terms of uh, the profile. I would like to do these blind, but I'm gonna show you here why that's not really possible. Um, I would do a blind, but if I were to do blind tasting hit comparison, remove these little sides, so I don't knock anything over. I would need colored glass, colored, not glasses, but colored glasses because uh, here is the electric tin. If you can tell it's darker. Right, it's got that copper color to it, and then Ardbeg Tan, typically really, really light. It has almost like a color of a Sauvignon Blanc. There's a slight, in fact, I can particularly see that there's a slight greenish tinge to it. That's other than that, it's pretty clear. So unless I had colored uh, glasses, you know, those you know, like those black Glen Cairns or something like that, it really wouldn't work to do this blind tasting. And I don't have a set of those. Maybe I should, I should probably get a set of those, you know, uh, for academic purposes, for testing. 
anyway, so I'm not doing a blind today. All right. Dun, 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 dun. Mark, how you doing? Uh, Jean-Philippe. I'm going to probably script your last name. Kershen. Kushense. Probably screwing it up. Uh, Jean-Philippe. And thank you much for tuning in. And he is up in Canada. In Quebec. He says Ardbeg is uh, 99.85. Because that's Canadian. I don't know what the conversion rate currently is for Canada. Yeah, I have to do my, I do my videos for the most part in American dollars. And if someone wants to know what it is in that wherever they're, their neck of the woods, uh, they can look it up and do that, do the exchange rate. Wow. Now, I have to admit, I am an Ardbeg fan. I have a little bit of a prejudice towards Ardbeg 10. I want to be as objective as possible as I can be about these two. I wish I had some colored Glen Cairns, you know, to go head to head between these two. But I would say on the nose, the Ardbeg 10, it, it, I don't know how to describe it. It is Ardbeggy. <laughs> There's something, I haven't yet to figure out what it is, but we're, every Ardbeg, what are you talking about? The Ardbeg drum, or which is done in the uh, rum cast, or the uh, Supernova, which is this big, intense, peated. Ardbeg or any other one, or the Ugadel, which is as the uh, Orgadel, which is as the uh, uh, sherry cask in it. They have a certain character, like Ardbeginess, uh, and I don't know how else to describe it other than it seems Ardbeggy. Uh, so this has a distinctive Ardbeginess. There's a little bit of a chocolate in it there. I would say the fruit character is one of the main uh, distinctive differences. This is more, I get more green uh, uh, lemon lime character, green apple character. Of course, all the fruit is charred, right? So it's it's lemon and lime on a grill. It does have um, the chocolate notes in there, a little nuttiness. Going back over to the, uh, huh. it was funny. When, when you take two things, and you put them head to head, the differences pop. You, you notice it more. So like if you have a brand new undershirt, like a brand new white shirt, just took it out of the package. And yeah, you do your laundry and you clean your undershirts and stuff. But if you take an older undershirt out of the drawer that you say is clean, and, you, and I don't care what they say in the commercials, but Tide or whatever laundry detergent you use, when you take an older white shirt and you take a brand new one, you know, just out of the package, and you put them next to each other, the older white shirt doesn't look quite as white, as bright white, unless you have someone who knows how to do the laundry better than I do. I mean, yeah, it looks white. I'm, yeah, it's a white T-shirt. But when you put it to a brand new one right out of the package, it's like, pow, wow, that white just really, really stands out, right? Or if you take a white piece of, you take, you see like your wall, your wall is white, you know, it's painted white, but rarely does anybody use 100% just straight up white. It's usually an off-white right, orange paint in your walls. But if you take a white piece of paper and you put it up against your wall, which is some variation vanilla cream white, whatever the hell it is they want to call it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, sorting your whiteies, your tidy whiteies. Uh, you know, vanilla, they call vanilla cream white, or they get like get some, they don't call it white number 436. You know, they got to get some fancy name for the paint. But if you take a white, brand new white piece of paper and you put it up against your wall, then your wall doesn't look so white. You thought it was white, but then you put it up against a white piece of paper and you go, oh, wow, that's white. Okay. Similar when you're doing head-to-head -head comparison whiskeys is those distinctions, those differences between the whiskeys really go, oh, right here. And I would say right now, one of the main things, um, uh, one of the main things on um, um, this popping out, is the oceanic character, but but uh, uh, there are distilleries right next to the ocean, such as Glen Morangy, that don't have any seem to have any oceanic character. And then there's some I've had some peated whiskeys from the Highlands that have an oceanic character. Um, you know, I, I'm not 100% convinced that's the ocean. I don't think it's not coming from the water, coming through the still. I know that much, uh, but if you taste a uh, if you taste a Bowmore, if you taste a Bowmore. That was aged on Isla versus a Bomar, which is most of Bomar, is aged on the inland, right? Because that's where it's going to be bottled. 
you can tell the difference. You, there is a slight difference in there. <laughs> Michael, Michael sees to the night says, never argue with the wife when we choose white variants for the living room. Exactly. So there's a slight little, I would say more of a salty, more of an oceanic character coming from the Ardbeg 10. I was going to say, I originally thought, in fact, when I was originally spending some time with Electric, because this is the first time I've ever gone head to head with it. I haven't done that off camera. Um, I was thinking that the Electric was a little more ashy, but, right? So here's nothing. So my Ardbeg 10 is right about here, right? Due for a new bottle. It, it seems to be it seems to be coming out a little more ashy as well. This is a little bit more again. This is these are like these aren't like huge contrasting differences. You know, like whoa, that's way over here, and this is way over here. No, these are these are subtle differences that you're only gonna notice when you put them actually next to each other. This the electric is a little bit more of an apple that you cut. You know, you cut up an apple and uh, it starts to turn brown if it's been oxidized a little bit. It's a little bit like that, just a little bit, and a little bit more of a, a stone fruit. Note. So like a peach, but of course you're competing with all the smoke and everything else. That's it's sort of interfering with um, or competing with the aromatics of the uh, fruit notes. But it's definitely in there. I would say the electric has a little bit more. It had the electric has a little bit more of a nutty note than the uh, Ardbeg does. Um, Trooper Henry, thank you very much for. Uh, <laughs> he says thank you for. It's, uh, glad to see you live and kicking, man. I'm putting out seven videos a week. I'm putting out four to five shorts, one live stream, and two regular videos, you know, 10 to 15 minute uh, whiskey reviews. So I'm I'm plenty alive seven days a week putting out content, man. I'm, I'm the I'm probably the busy, busiest whiskey tuber. And I'm planning on doing it. So that means about 250 uh short videos per year. Uh probably around 104 um uh, re full regular videos. And 52 live streams a year, so I'm probably the I'm the bu busiest uh, uh, whiskey tuber alive. Hopefully, I can maintain this pace without getting burned out. But I'm really, really enjoying it. All right, let's go on the palate. I'm gonna drink some water first because I was drinking some, some a little bit of the uh, Johnny Walker Black. Cloud Hooker, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. So, so, I wasn't planning on doing this, but, but I wanted something to warm up with. One of the interesting things that if you're just tuning in is, is to compare a peated blended scotch, such as the uh, uh, Naked Grouse Black, the, the Black Grouse, uh, or any of the other ones uh, with the with the uh, single malt peated. All right, I'm gonna start with, uh, I'm gonna start with the electric first. Hmm. Some nice sweetness going on in there. That nuttiness shows up on the back end. Now, which one's better? I think it's going to be much more of a sub, more subjective, more subjective. The main thing that would be my criteria wouldn't be necessarily do I like this flavor better or the aroma over this one, but structurally, for me, if you notice, you watch my videos. Structurally, how is the development in terms of front, middle, and finish is going to be. The deciding factor um not necessarily what's got these flavors or this has got these flavors and i like these flavors more than these flavors because that could be more of a subjective preference but i think structurally in terms of how it develops um is gonna be uh the deciding factor and i've got i'll, I'll hold all the i have one comment i hope i don't forget um i think there's one factor and some other whiskey tubers uh, have made similar comments that I think is putting the weight towards more, a little bit more towards Ardbeg. <laughs> Michael Hassler says, okay, 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 okay. You guys are being silly. Um, 
Let's see, I bring up the chat. Um, nope, don't want that. There we go. Um, okay, I usually don't bring up comments because because I need multiple windows. He says my ex uh, my ex wife has been sleeping with my friend on the side. He's been pretty m miserable lately. <laughs> Nothing whiskey related. I just thought it was funny. So in order to bring up ch comments like that, it's um, I had to hop around with the mouse and the windows and all that stuff, which is not too uh, convenient. Um, but there you go. Anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, uh, Ex-wife jokes. We need some ladies to make some ex-husband jokes to keep it even, right? Or some dudes who have ex-husbands. I, I don't care uh, to come up with ex-husband jokes. All right. So a little bit more of a nutty in the background. A little bit again. This is these are subtle differences. A little bit more of a, a grilled stone fruit. I, I would thus far more on the ashy side of the smoke. Hmm. Hmm. Jean Philippe says Port Charlotte is amazing. Actually, I discovered them because of this channel. Oh, awesome. So I did a Port Charlotte 10 versus an Ardbeg 10. And if I recall correctly, I kind of gave the edge actually to Port Charlotte. And the reason why is if, if you haven't, you can go back and watch that video. The reason why is the casking. Compare the casking of the Port Charlotte with Ardbeg 10 and the extra cast bring in, to bring in some sherry cast, bring in a little bit more complexity with the Port Charlotte, giving it an advantage. And it has more of a savory note uh, than the Ardbeg 10 does. And that's why, I mean, that's really what makes um, uh, the Port Charlotte 10 stand so, so uh, out so well. So even though I'm a big Ardbeg fan, I you know, the, the Port Charlotte, because the casking, it's absolutely fan fantastic. Really, really like that. So, Jean Philippe, uh, you're right. Uh, Christopher Malloy, thank you very much for uh, tuning in, man. He says uh, the PC10 uses wine cast. Nothing wrong with wine cast. Uh, use the wine cast. It's a plus, definitely. Of course, sherry is a fortified wine. All right. So, our back 10. A little more lemon and lime, grilled, of course. Um, uh, the lechic, a little bit more, um, in terms of fruit character, a little bit more of grilled stone fruit, uh, oxidized apple, you know, once it's been sitting out. Uh, a little bit more nutty character to it. This is more fresh, a little bit more fresh and limey and juicy, almost a little bit slight tropical notes to it. The peak smoke character is... Fairly similar, fairly similar, maybe just a little bit more ashy on the electric tin. Now, tasting peat on top of peat on top of peat on top of peat. I know Scott and Bart over Scott's Test Dummies, they do these peated shootouts. By the way, uh, if you're a praying person, pray for Scott. He's like 75 days into this COVID crap, and he's done, got pulled back his smell and taste yet. I'm hoping uh, he gets it back and gets it back soon so they can get back into the normal action. Uh, good, good friends, uh, Scott and Bart. Um, at least hope for the best for him. All right, root for him. Um, for me, I quickly get saturated with, with smoke and peat and to continue tasting another peated and another peated, another peated, a peated whiskey isn't really going to work. Isn't really going to work for me. Um, so it's, I, I went last year, I've gone for a number of different years. Then uh, going to these, uh, it's the Institute of Master Wine Bordeaux tasting. Uh, so, some of them I've worked and uh, doing photography, doing interviews, uh, do, do some work for the Institute of Master Wine. And they have like 60 chateaux from Bordeaux of a particular vintage. So it's four years after the vintage. So four years afterwards and 60 producers. That's a lot. So Bordeaux, you have the right bank, east bank, and this broke down into sub 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 regions. Um, so what? And the masters of wine, I watch them, and they're taking notes. They taste them all, and they're taking these notes. I can't do that because after a while, and I talked to one master master sommelier, 
uh, uh, excuse me, Master of Wine, uh, Master of Wine. Uh, he's actually a medical doctor as well. Um, I was like, I can't do that. After a while, they all taste the same to me. He goes, yep. I said, so what do you recommend? He says, pick representatives of the different sub appellations within Bordeaux. Pick a, pick a particular one and then follow it for years. Uh, and then so you're comparing vintage to vintage to vintage and producing, uh, comparing sub-region to sub-region. So I have 10 Bordeaux producers that I follow uh, on the east and right bank. And I taste them every year, just those 10. So out of 60 producers, I only taste 10. And I taste them those same producers every year uh, as representatives because saturation is very, very, very quick. Of course, you can drink water uh, and all that kind of thing. You want, uh, um, Yeah, you can actually use uh, a high acid white wine or a satern uh, to cleanse the palate because the high acidity sort of cleanses the palate and, and changes things. But you get palate fatigue. That's and, and those are you know 14 5 13 5 to 14 5 to ABV. We're talking 40 percent ABV plus, and then peat for me, palate fatigue sets in really, really, really quick. So I'm at my best, I think most accurate, sticking to two. Just stick to two, um, take good notes, and then compare the others. More than that, I kind of get a little bit. Mm, which is another good reason to start it off with a uh, with a blend, with a with a blend that has just a, a smoke. So you're sort of not jumping with a blank slate into these two on a, with a with a fresh palate, but sort of warming things up. And I didn't even I didn't even finish it. Just stick a little bit in here. Just get, sort of get things a little bit establish sort of a baseline with just a little bit of smoke, just a little bit of peat, and use something and no malt from from a, a smoky. Uh, blended scotch, and I think established a really good baseline to then get on into the malts. So another good reason to start off with uh, with something like this, All right? So um, there is another character to the lechic. It's a little bit more uh, toffee, a little bit more of the toffee note. I think there's a little bit more of a almost like a fresh fruit or canned fruit tropical note, more with the um, Ardbeg Ten. More of a grilled, as I said before, more of a grilled stone fruit note, a uh, little bit more of um, the, the toffee note. Uh, peat and smoke, I'm going to drink some water. Seems fairly similar to it. Okay, so these are the general profiles. Now I want to compare, this is the ultimate. This is really, I think the deciding, one of the deciding factors is, how's the finish? I think in terms of the development, the transitions, even though there are different aromas and flavors, slightly different aromas and flavors, I think in terms of the qualitative transitions are evenly head, head to head. They both have really good transitions, mouthfeel, and differences between the front, the middle, and to the finish. The question is, what about the length of finish? So finish, does it, um, you, you taste it, and then it just kind of disappears, boop, falls off a cliff. Or does it kind of slowly start to uh, dissipate, right? Or does it just seem to just go and go and go? So the, um, the like the Konamara Mizanera cask, one of the longest finishes. If you hadn't seen, that's, I did that during uh, 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 Ireland Irish whiskey series, one of the longest sustained spicy uh, exotic finishes of any whiskey I've ever had. Uh, mouthfeel. Uh, so mouthfeel, how it can feel thin, it can feel mouth coating, it can feel like it has weight, right? So, and sometimes that's related to alcohol, but it's also related to oils. So if you chill filter, right, chill filtering a whiskey, right, because you're removing some of those oils and the chill filtering makes it feel thinner and it changes the mouth feel. Unchill filtered, you're leaving in some of those oils, it gives it a different texture to it and a little bit creamier, a little smoothier, a little smoothier, smoother, smoothier, a little more of a roundness, a little bit more of a, a, a weight to it. And I like that. I don't want a super thin uh, mouth feel on a whiskey. Now, if you want something, say like wine, you want something light and refreshing and, and not, 
you know, said on a warmer day, you might want to go with something with a, a thinner, lighter uh, uh, mouthfeel rather than something big and heavy, right? Bourbons, for example, have tend to have really a lot of depth, a lot of good mouthfeel, particularly the higher ABV ones, because you, and you get a lot of the uh, essences coming out of the cast, really round coating mouthfeel, right? So that's just why I, I did it in, a, in another video where you take, I'm going to do it with water just for sake of, uh, for example, is you, all right, I'll do it with this. You take it in like this. Mm-mm. Acting like Patterson. Richard Patterson makes those weird things. All right. So, actually, when I ch check for mouthfeel on whiskeys, I actually do a lot longer than that. I let it sit there for like a minute or two. You can let it sit uh, and how and sort of pay attention. I don't swish it like a mouthwash. Don't go, you know, don't do this. But do kind of let it sit and go, even like get in between your teeth and feel how your mouth responds to it in the mouthfeel. So that's mouthfeel, mouthfeel. So you're talking about texture. So you have aromas, flavors, and textures, textures. When people talk about a whiskey being smooth, they're not talking about a flavor. You're talking about a texture, the way something feels, right? So mouthfeel. Um, Fairly similar, fairly similar. All right, so I meant to, what I wanted to do was check the finish. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start with the electric on the finish. Actually, to be honest with you, the electric has a better finish now than it when I reviewed it. Pfft. What is lasting right now? When I snap my fingers, that's, that's when the fruit character stopped. When I snap my fingers, the fruit character stopped. What I'm getting now is uh, chocolate mint, which I think I mentioned in the video. Um, it's yeah, yeah, it, it's it, it, which is a little bit more like a Lafroy ten character. Than a, what I would get from a, a, an Ardbeg ten is that in that sus, in, the, in the sustaining. Think of like dropping a rock in a pond and get the ripples, or you take your finger and put it on a piano, ding, and it gets you know it goes quieter and quieter. You know after hitting your your ding or plucking a guitar, and it it goes quieter. That's what a whiskey does on, on in terms of the finish. It's like dong. Or ding, or drop a, or like a, a ripples. You know, if they kind of get smaller and smaller as they, as they go out, that is the finish on a on a whiskey. And it's actually, of course, I'm getting it down a little bit more down below the shoulder. It, the finish is actually showing up better now than it did when I did my review. But what is mostly there is uh, the, the 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 fruit drops, kind of mid level, not super short, but a little mid level, and what sticks around. Is the Lafroig tin sort of that uh, chocolate mint character? All right, hard big. Um, okay, so uh, Grammy Johnson says, Who owns Ardbeg? Uh, I honestly don't know. So, Chris Ramoy is correct. LV Mates, which is Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton, Mouton, no, Moet Hennessy, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy. So, they also own Glenn Morangy. Uh, if you Google them, they own a gazillion businesses. But in terms of Scotch distilleries, they own Ardbeg and Glen Morangy. Um, yeah. Um, Monet? Monet? I don't think it's Monet. I think it's Mouton. I don't know. Hennessy. Um, but anyway, they also own Glen Morangy. So a rep who reps for one will usually rep for the other. So if you go do a tasting with a rep, you can usually taste... One after another, a Glen Morangy, as well as um, a, an Ardbeg. In fact, I, uh, when I was in the Bay Area a couple of years ago, I met a, he was from Scotland, but he was living in San Jose. Um, and he, we had to taste both of them. That's sort of got how I 
got more into Ardbeg than I am now. All right. Ardbeg 10. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Moet Hennessy, Louis Vuitton. Moet Hennessy, yeah, LVMH. No, it's LVMH, not uh, MHLV. LV. Fruit character on the Ardbeg 10 lasts a little bit longer. It's more of a chocolatey smoke versus an ashy smoke. A little bit more of an oceanic character on the finish. A little bit more of a saltiness and a more a little bit more of a tropical note. So no. You may, you know, maybe for you you like the more of the toffee note or whatever you're getting out of it, more than Ardbeg. Maybe you like the stone fruit note more than the lemon and lime tropical notes from the art from the Ardbeg. You know, that those are those are personal preferences. And so you might go more lechic than over Ardbeg, right? So this that all that is very subjective. But I think the finish on the Ardbeg 10 is better than the finish on uh, the Lechic 10. And for me, going head to head, that would be the deciding factor that uh, the Ardbeg 10 narrowly, and I think fairly narrow, narrowly beats uh, the Lechic 10, mostly because of the finish, mostly because of the finish. Now we're getting Nick Picky, right? If you, you remember the slide that I showed earlier, if you're watching live now and you didn't see it, I just put a slide, I'll put it back up. Um, I mean, look at this. They're so close on so many ways. Um, in terms of PPM, in terms of the intensity of the peat, it seemed fairly, fairly similar. The, you know, the difference between the 3755 is not showing up. Both being unchilled, bouldered, similar cast, similar ABV, you know, 0.3% difference, big whoop, and price wise. So they're really, really, really good alternatives. And um, it, I mean, if I was, if someone was gonna only, only buy one, I said, yeah, go Ardbeg 10, but you will not be sad with the Lechic 10. It's an absolutely fantastic whiskey that gives you a slightly different profile from the time in which you want something slightly different. I think it's a, a fantastic whiskey, like it a lot. I tended to go in my point scores, go a little bit more like a 92. Uh, for the Ardbeg 10, and I think for I went for an even 90 for the Lechic 10, and, and it was again when I did my video, it was really the the finish uh, that was the uh, deciding factor. All righty, uh, Jason Pan just wrote something in a foreign language, in uh, another language, which I can't read. Hopefully, it's <coughs> not saying something uh, nasty. Uh, I don't think I have a moderator in the house tonight. If I have uh, Silver Lock Whiskey Club, thank you much for uh, tuning in. All righty. So we're about 12 minutes before the top of the hour. I want to respond to a question. Got an email. I hope he doesn't mind. I did cut out his email. Um, but I think I spend the rest of this live stream. I'm going to go like at least another 12 minutes. Keep this about 10 hours. Excuse me, about one hour. 10 hours. That'd be nuts. Um, so here we go. All right. So John Miller asks, he says, I just found your channel. That's awesome. Love it, man. That's awesome. I have a question just starting out uh, and have a few bottles now, mostly Johnny Walker Black, right, which I just warmed up with before the, as the show was starting in. Green and blue and fire at $20, so what the heck, why not go for the money? So I've had others and love Isla. But I have about 300 bucks to spend. I'm assuming American. I was debating Ardbeg's. Just going to start with the Ardbeg 10, $54. So it's about the same price as my neighborhood. Also going to get Port Charlotte, 69 But you know, wise choices. All right? Because, in fact, we've been talking about these two uh, whiskeys throughout this whole stream, right? So you're, you're, you're good, solid with, with both of those. What would you recommend to round out to the other good bottles to start with? Leaves me about $180. Of course, you got tax, right? And I don't know what state you're in. It depends on your taxes, but I, I get you. Appreciate any feedback you'd like to have. Uh, two to four more bottles to learn uh, with my buddies. All right, so $180, two to four bottles. All right. So um, I sent him, I responded to his email, let him know I'm going to respond live. That way, it's not just answering one person. I can answer 
other people might be interested in the answer as well. So two to four bottles, $180. You're looking to get into um, peated whiskeys. My recommendation would be, and the problem is, is the prices for $180 is to explore more of Isla potentially. But, you know, you're talking, um, I'd say Lagavulin in 12, Lagavulin in 16, you're talking 15, 115 to 120 bucks, right? Boom, man, that takes up more than half of that 180 bucks. That leaves you with maybe 50, 60 bucks, right? So, and definitely don't get a Bowmore. Don't go Kalila, right? Um, and I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go Kalila. Um, I'm trying to think. No, I no, I hadn't. I don't have a pre-decided answer on this. I'm just not thinking. Uh, Mark says Johnny Walker Black or Double Black, right? Um. In terms of cost, you know, that might be a good idea. Get, so go with a single malt, let's say a Lagavulin in 12 or a Lagavulin in 16, right? So hot, a little higher end, a little bit more money, and then something less expensive. Oh, but he already says he has the Johnny Walker Black. He already has the Johnny Walker Black. So he's already got that. So you don't, I wouldn't go with another blend. I wouldn't, wouldn't go with another blend. What are some high quality price ratio whiskeys that you could, oh, uh, that you could get, that you could get, I would have to check the prices. My tendency is to want to go, wow. Um, how much is a lot Gorm from Kilholman? Let me check it out. I didn't, I didn't, let me see how much, let's see how much a lot Gorm is. Um, but up, but up, but up, of course, this is my neighbor. Although his prices seem close to mine. Um, Kilhoman. Lock. Oop, lock. Gorm. Lock form, not lock gorm. Damn. I hate autocorrect. Gosh. It keeps trying to autocorrect when I'm typing. Uh, all right. So I'm thinking I'm thinking Kahoma and Lockworm. Because it's sherry cask. Or okay. So the, the lock gorm lock gorm is about 125 bucks. If we want to stick with Ardbeg. Ugadol or Cory Vrecken, right? Ugadol and Cory Vrecken are probably like 70 bucks. I, I, I would probably go, um, let's just let's, let's try it here. Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, because those are those are higher ABV, right? I think like 57.1, somewhere around there. Um, they are... The Corey Reckon is ninety dollars, right? So that keeps us under hundred bucks, right? He now he has another ninety bucks to play with, right? So one hundred eighty bucks. Now he's got a ninety, another ninety bucks to play with. So you could even get an Ardbeg Wee Beastie for about forty-seven dollars. Um, da -da 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 -da. And the Ugadol is seventy dollars. Okay. Let's go with the Ugadol. I'll recommend Ugadol because of the sherry cask, right? I try peat and sherry. I love peat and sherry together. That's right. So, uh, according to my records, Corey Vrecken is a little bit more expensive at 90 bucks. The Ugadol is 70 bucks. So, you get, in terms of budget wise, you're saving 20 bucks, right? So, that's good. Bing, bing. All right. So, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Ugadol. I'm going to go Ardbeg Ugadol, uh, higher ABV. Only about 70 bucks or so, and you're getting that sherry cask influence. Now, I do you don't want to go art bag, art bag, art bag, art bag with everything. But if it's 70 bucks, and now we have $110, give or take to play with, 
what can we get for 110 bucks that's peated uh, and and is going to sort of fill that price range? Let's try. Let's see what we got for Kilhoman. The Macker Bay is only 46 bucks. The Seneg, Seneg, right? Okay, so the Seneg, the uh, Ardbeg Seneg, S A N A I G, is sort of like the little brother of the Lot Gorm. Lot Gorm's in terms of price wise is going to be too much, but the Seneg is about 75 bucks, right? So, all right, all right. So th that's going to be my two recommendations, right? Let's go uh, Ardbeg, Ugudal, Kilhoman, Seneg, and that gets you under the $180. Two that I think are really, really excellent uh, peated whiskeys. As an alternative, let's check and see what, see what the price is on a Lagavulin in 16. Seventy-five bucks, or seventy-five bucks. So there's a third option. Se uh, uh, seventy-five bucks. Lagavulin sixteen is not as much as I thought it was. It's not as not as expensive. I think I was thinking of the Lagavulin twelve because the gas strength that tends to be over over um, over hundred bucks. Just to verify. All right. So there are three there there are three things to play with. Another art bag. Let's go to Ugudal price wise. Kilhoman, uh, the Seneg. I would like you to get the Lot Gorm, but price-wise, it's kind of taking a bigger bite out of your budget. And then uh, the other one is the Lagavulin 16, because Lagavulin really has a distinctive character to it, and I think the Lagavulin 16 has been really, really good at uh, maintaining its prices and not going crazy with a lot of like a lot of other distilleries are. So I think those are three really, really uh, good options. Um, if you can watch this on the replay, it takes a day or two before the chat will actually show up on, on the replay. Uh, but I think uh, there's some good options up in here and here as well. Uh, Christopher Moy is saying the Aristone uh, 10 landmark. I, say, I haven't had an Aristone, but Aristone sounds like if you take uh, Aerosmith and the Rolling Stones, you put them together and you get Aristone. Um, some other options. Ugadol is almost not possible to find too. Uh, every oh, but, but you're in Canada. Sorry, Canada just has a pro as 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 difficulties. Uh, Christian Malloy says Fenlagen Old Reserve. Not familiar with that one. Um, so Kevin Wabicki says, "What? Uh, how about Kilcarran? Kilcarran, fantastic whiskeys. It's a different uh, character." Um, Doug Christop says the long grow non age statement is 60 bucks. That's another good option. Okay, but in terms of where you're going on your journey, where you're going on your journey, so do you want to learn Isla and focus on Isla? Or do you want to now, okay, let's do, I, I got an Isla, let's do some comparison with Campbelltown. And that's just a matter of different directions, right? So it, 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 within your budget, if you want to go, okay, I've got a couple of islas, I've got an iron bag, right? Maybe I get that Ugudo. Now let's try a different kind of peatiness. Let's go Campbelltown, you know, just to, which is um, as, as the crow flies, right? It's not that far away, but as a distinctive character uh, uh, there. So I think um, Doug Christoph is, is, that's a really, really good option is to go. The, so long grow, in case you don't know, Long Grow is produced by Springbank, Springbank, uh, which is uh, which is on the Kintar Peninsula. Uh, there's three distilleries there, um, so that's another. So Long Grow non age statement. So Long Grow also does these Long Grow tens, these uh, red wine casts. They do it every year. So yeah, that's another good option, and I think it's fairly widely available. Uh, the Long Grow non age statement. So yeah, that's a good. Option. I have a bottle. I haven't tasted it in a while. I need to refresh my memory, but I, I, I Doug, uh, I Doug Christoph, I think I agree. I think I, I agree. Um, so it's a matter. So someone recommend the, recommend the We Beastie. Um, at another time, at a, at, a, at a night, another time. So I, so I think that's probably what I would go with. Yep. Um, I would go with the Seneg. I think the Seneg 
either Lagavulin 16 or uh, and the Ugaro, uh would probably really, uh, really fit in there. All righty. So we're hitting the uh, top of the uh, one hour mark. Um, I want to thank everyone who tuned in. We have 49 people watching, which is totally, totally awesome. Had a fantastic time. Had some fantastic whiskeys. If you're watching on the replay, be sure to give a like. Hey, if you guys are watching now, be sure to give a like, right? Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, because it helps the algorithm and people watch. Um, uh, it gives more attention to the video. So if you haven't already, give it a like. All righty, absolutely fantastic whiskeys. Next week, same time, Lord willing, same place. Move on to two other head-to-head -head whiskeys, a Highland first is an Isla. What will it be? Haven't made up my mind yet. We will find out. Coming up this next week, uh, I'm going to be doing a review of the Talisker, uh, but it's not the Talisker 10. It's um, one ed aged in an Amoroso cast. Really, really interesting whiskey. I've already uh, popped the cork out. Absolutely fantastic whiskey. All right, again, uh, thanks for everyone for uh, tuning in, and uh, we'll go out with just a little bit of rock and roll. Slangiva. <laughs>